We can't make anyone learn, but we can offer them the opportunity to learn. I wake up in the morning and、uh, I think, well, I woke up again today, so there must be a reason. And a lot of people said, at your age, you're going for a hot air balloon ride, but I never thought about it. It just, I was ready at that time to do it. Welcome to Elder Wisdom Stories from the Green Bench, a podcast for and about seniors with heart, hope, and lots of laughter. I'm your host, Erin Davis, and I'll be joined today by my co host, Doug Robinson, who resides at the village of Sandalwood Park in Brampton, part of the Schlegel Village's retirement homes and long term care seniors' residences community. They're the folks who came up with this idea, and we're so happy that it's caught on and that people who've never even heard of a podcast are now listening and enjoying and sharing this closeness with us. The Green Bench, and yes, it began as actual benches, both at the residences and traveling around various communities, is a place to connect, to hear stories, to share, and to listen. And we're so glad you're here today because our guest is June Campbell, a resident of Riverside Glen in Guelph. June Campbell has lived a life that has not only witnessed history as it happened, but in which she even rubbed elbows with a great Canadian actor with whom she went to school and one of history's all time most revered and respected statesmen. June was born in Newfoundland before it was even a part of Canada, but that's only part of her story. There's so much more. Welcome in, Doug. It's nice to have you here on the green bench today as we prepare to welcome June Campbell. Now, I have to ask you you're a man of many travels, but have you ever been to Newfoundland? No, I haven't, but I've been to Vancouver. Aha!、Uh-huh. And Quebec City. Okay. And, and the Caribbean. Oh. The White House. So I've traveled a little bit, but I don't think I've traveled as much as June has. I think you're right. And you neglected to mention where you picked up that accent of yours. Oh, South London. <laughs> there you go. So while we're going back to roots, let's start there with June Campbell. June, welcome to the Green Bench. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. We're so glad to have you here. And、uh, you have lived a particularly proud moment in Canadian history. And you can remember 73 years ago when Newfoundland officially joined Canada. And an interesting bit of timing there, too, because Doug, as you noticed, it happened just moments before midnight on a certain day the 31st of March. Why the 31st of March? Why just a few moments before midnight, June? Because the premier at the time, Joseph Smallwood, did not want any jokes about April Fools. There you go. So he had the things, the th- things signed just before midnight on the 31st, so it couldn't be done on the April 1st, April Fools' Day. So then we all became naturalized citizens. And there were some other changes at that time as you went from being Newfoundlanders to becoming Canadians. And this is something that our friend Doug, of course, can relate to. And it's a story he relayed in our last podcast. But、uh, that whole thing about driving on the other side of the road. Side of the road. Yeah. Oh, yes. I, when I got my、uh, driver's license, I learned to drive on the left hand side of the road.、Mm-hmm. And we had our own currency and our own stamps and paid duty on anything my mother ordered from Canada. Even from the Sears catalog? Yes. Unbelievable. What was that like, that transition? I remember being in England in the early 1970s when they changed their currency. And as a kid, that was big news. But what do you remember most clearly about that transition in 1949?、Uh, not a great deal, actually, because I was only 16. So, you know. At 16, you have other things on your mind. Men? Other than politics. <laughs> But it was, it was a big transition. And there were people that wore black armbands for a year afterwards in mourning. Oh. Oh, they took it very seriously. When did you leave the rock, June? When I got married in 54. Okay. My husband to be was,、um, 
studying at university in Halifax in his final year, and uh, so I joined him there. Now, he was a civil engineer. That's right. uh, But this wasn't a marriage that was destined to last. How long were you married? I was married 22 years. Well, that's a good try. That's a good... Yeah, that's a good starter marriage, June. That's what we call that one. (laughs) Starter marriage. (laughs) But your experience is very much the same as our last guest, Joyce. Her mother got over it, but you had a religious difference between yourself and your husband. Yes. Sir. And your folks never, never got over that. Is that correct? No, they, they never accepted it, no. no. But my husband didn't practice his faith. I mean, he didn't go to Mass and things like that. Yeah. But it was just the thought of, uh, uh, I guess, the mixed marriage. And he was Catholic, yes. and you were Protestant, mm-hmm. and your mom would never say your husband's name, only the father of your children? Mm-hmm. Wow. Yep. What was that like for you? I just got used to it after a while. She. That's very sad, June. Yes, but uh, it, it, didn't, it didn't affect our marriage. Religion was the least of our problems. We had yes, other issues. And thus the end of the marriage after 22 years. Mm-hmm. Let's go back to your education. June. Yes. You went to a girls' school. Yes. And it was very strict. Very strict. And you used to have to walk in a crocodile line. Yes. <laughs> and then the boys walked past you on the other side. You weren't allowed to look at them. No. Nope. But did you used to take a quick peek? Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the boys' school was Bishop Field. The girls was Bishop Spencer. And uh, never the twain should meet, except at uh, chemistry classes. We would go over in our crocodile and use their uh, lab. Well, how appropriate is that, that chemistry classes is where the two sexes would meet? No, they wouldn't meet. No, they'd be in their room. They wouldn't be close to us. Oh, no. okay. No, and, um, of course, I wasn't there then because when war broke out, my father, being a policeman, uh, was sent to a... In a seaport where they were trying to ship paper to England and the Germans were coming in in their U-boats and, you know, setting fire to the paper sheds and generally making pests of themselves. So we did have a lot of Germans in Newfoundland. You did? Yeah, and then the Americans set up three big bases, uh, Army, uh, Air Force and Navy. And from a, a country where there was no crime to speak of, suddenly there was a great deal of it because you can't bring all those extra people in and not have repercussions. That is so interesting because now in the 21st century, we have this idea, and of course it's based in fact of come from away, Newfoundland being so welcoming and open doors to everyone. Mm -hmm. But there was a time when people were coming in that were definitely not welcome and with good reason. Well, they were welcome in a way because they brought a, an improved standard of living to the province. They paid higher wages. It was ex- a lot of extra work that uh, hadn't been around before. And, of course, many of our females married the American soldiers. June? Yes? Have you been to see the play come from away? Oh, yes. My wife and I went to see it. It was a marvellous, marvellous show. Yes, and it's based on a very interesting book. Very, very interesting. Yes. The cast was magnificent in it. Yes, they were They were excellent. Of course, it's based on the story of 9-11 when all of the air traffic had to find a place to land, and so many found themselves in Newfoundland, and it's an incredible story. You mentioned the book, June. You are, we understand, a voracious reader, and you are a big proponent of reading and the value of a good education. Why don't we talk a little bit about that? What do you enjoy, and how much has reading brought to your life? Reading has brought a great deal to my life. I was an only child till I was nine, and we lived in this small community of about 200 people. So I had nothing to read, except at Christmas time there'd be a book. But then we moved to a larger place of 5,000 people, and they had a Uh, a library, but children were only allowed to use it on Saturdays and take out one book. So I I used it on Saturday and took out three books. As soon as they opened, read it, took it back, lunchtime, took another one, (laughs) read that, and then took a third one for the week. 
And then I read everything that was printed, including recipes and whatnot. And then I would go to my father's office and use his police manuals and try and read those. But he put paid to that one day when I wandered in and said, Daddy, what does R-A-P-E mean? Oh, dear. <laughs> that was Oops. the end of my reading the police manuals. I guess. <laughs> you were getting an education he didn't plan on. I was seven. Oh, gosh, seven. <laughs> well, you did end up getting a scholarship to go to university. Tell us about that, how you achieved the scholarship, and then what happened? Well, I my age was against me. You had to be 16 by the 30th of June, and I wasn't 16 until the 20th of July. So I missed out. And it was $600. That was a lot of money in those days. That's a lot of money in those days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Junior Jubilee Scholarship, it was called. Do you have an idea where you would have gone, what you would have studied? I was thinking about social work. I don't know why. But there was no chance of my going to university, so it was uh, something I didn't think to a great deal about. You went on, of course, as you mentioned, to marry a civil engineer, and then your travels took you to Halifax and then Montreal and Ottawa. Now, one of your children sort of followed in your footsteps in terms of academia because she has gone on to get a Ph.D. in Physics? In physics. <laughs> and wow. I can't add two and two. <laughs> My, oh, don't say that. They say, now, Doug, I don't know if you'll agree with this, but they say that children get their brains from their mothers. <laughs> That's <laughs> quite true. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe in her case, she gets it from the males in the family. Well, there's another female. There's, they're all engineers. My brother's an engineer. His three children are engineers. Goodness. Wow, they are all making the world better. Her father was an engineer, so... Oh, yeah. okay. You split with her dad after 22 years, and mm. there you were, 40 years old, three children, and then, all of a sudden, love strikes again. Mm -hmm. Would you like to tell us about that? Well, I uh, had to go back to work. I was a stay-at-home mother, and after the marriage broke up, I had to go back to work, and I was very fortunate to landing a really good job because I'd done a lot of volunteer work and had a lot of contacts. But anyway, yes, I was there about a year and uh, no chance of meeting anyone else. I wasn't even remotely interested. And uh, the phone rang one day and I answered it and this male voice said, this is a voice out of your past. I hadn't heard his voice in 25 years, but I recognized it. As soon mm -hmm. as he said that, he had a very distinctive voice. And this was the man I married the following year. June? Yes. You said that after your divorce that you were done with men. That's right. What advice would you give to young listeners when it comes to taking a second chance on love? Well, I didn't feel I was taking a great chance because I had known this man. He was uh, married with a child and I was a teenager in the same church choir and I lost touch with him because he went to the sea and he was with the railway. They transferred him to the Maritimes. And I heard later on that his wife died. I don't know, she was only 40 when she had an aneurysm. Mm. So he was left with a teenage son. So when we met each other, I remet after all those years, um, I knew his background. I, as it turned out, I knew his family. He was the youngest of 10 children. And his older siblings were my parents' closest friends, and I wasn't aware of that. They were bridge partners. So that, that helped, you know, the fact that I knew his background and knew he was a decent and honorable person. And he had a marvelous sense of humor. And my th children just loved him. They thought he was wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Gordon was the youngest of ten children. There was a joke he used to make about that. Yes. He said, yes, we had 10, but they stopped when they attained perfection. Oh, my goodness. But, you, know, you know something? He, he believed He believed it. He believed it. He did believe it, did he? Well, I, I tend to think that you believe it, too, because you two were together for 30 years. Yes. And it was a wonderful marriage. Aww. And he had a wonderful way with words, and he had a good sense of humor. And whenever I got up strippers, he'd say, 
He wouldn't say calm yourself. He'd say clam yourself. Clam yourself. <laughs> That's a typo. <laughs> <That's> a kind... <laughs> <laughs> or as we call it, a taco, because you're talking and it's a typo. <laughs> <laughs> June, you've travelled all around the world with Gordon. Is there one place that you wouldn't want to visit? And can you tell us why you wouldn't want to go there? Well, we didn't go all the way around the world, but that's a bit of an exaggeration. But he says I married him for his Air Canada Pass, oh. and he married me for my underground parking. <laughs> Air Canada Pass and underground parking, that sounds like a match made in heaven, June. <laughs> <laughs> but but anyway, yes, I, we traveled a great deal, and uh, the only place I years ago as a child I thought I wanted to see Australia. But after we reading Bill Bryson's book about all the creepy crawlies and other animals in Australia, I decided that wouldn't be on my bucket list, and it wasn't. <laughs> so I never did get there. <laughs> yeah, if they were just creepy crawly, that'd be fine. But these things are like spiders the size of dinner plates. Oh no. no. No, that makes it worse. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, if you're looking for that book, it's called In a Sunburned Country. And the author... That's right. Yeah, Bill yeah. Bryson. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, mm -hmm. I'm going to avoid that book, June, if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> you may enjoy it. Coward. Yo, I'm a chicken, all right. Now, the one place that you have been 22 times is the beautiful island of Barbados. Yes. Can you tell us about that? Why that was such a heart home for you and Gordon? Well, I had been there once with my hus my first husband, and uh, when Gordon and I got married, and as I say, he had near Canada Pass, although he worked for the railway, he was doing claims for Air Canada. So he had very high priority because he went to work when he was 14. Mm. The youngest of 10 children, I guess, was my choice. So he had a very high priority because of his number of years. So we tootled off quite a bit. And we went to Barbados quite often. Yeah. What was it? We loved the people. And it was very Canadian in those days. There were Canadian banks and the supermarkets had Canadian products and whatnot. I'm going yeah. back, you know, the 70s. One of the other places you've traveled, and I'm so glad that I can say my husband and I have too, because who knows if or when we can ever go back, is Russia. What are your memories of Russia? Oh, my memories are wonderful. Especially the first trip, which I made with my first husband. It was supposed to be an engineering congress of Canadian and Soviet engineers. I don't think they knew we were in the country. After we landed and they gave us an air to a tourist guide, uh, they just left us alone. So we were really, uh, literally on our own. We didn't do what we wanted. But we had an in-tourist guide and... The men, of course, would tease her and ask about people in Russian history who didn't meet much approval. And she would just shrug and, say, and sniff and say, he was of no consequence. Oh. And that, was, that was the standard answer we got. But other than that, we were free to go. And then the second time we went, we were on a Baltic cruise and we were in Estonia when 9-11 occurred. Oh, my. And then we had to go on to Moscow for a week. Wow. Of course, all the planes were grounded. So oh. where? how did you get home from that cruise? Well, we got back to London, which was, we were supposed to deep plane from. And um, we finally got on. But, oh, it was, uh, it was very dicey. Yeah. We were glad to get home, believe me. I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Oh. So while we've been talking about travel here, June, and uh, Doug and I are both avid travelers, at least in our minds these days. You loved living in Ottawa, as I did certainly a few times, but you decided to move to southern Ontario to be closer to your daughter. And of mm -hmm. course, you're in Guelph now. Why was that the right decision for you? I'm very close to Elizabeth, my daughter here in Guelph, and she's been here for 26 years. So Gordon and I used to come and visit her quite often and stay with her. So, uh, this was like a second home. And uh, last year I was in hospital for seven months. And it was awfully hard on her because she couldn't visit me and I was in Ottawa. Mm. And uh, so all things being equal, we decided it would be better if I moved here, which I did. And this is a beautiful facility. It's just lovely. I loved the, where I was in Ottawa and I had a lot of friends after 60 years there. But uh, I'm outliving them all anyway, so... 
I'm here. <laughs> yeah, it's all about making the new connections where you are. Now, how are you making it feel more like home there at Riverside Glen? Well, the um, the staff are absolutely marvelous. I can't say enough about them. They're very yeah. outgoing. They get along well with each other, which is really something. And this is why most of them are, have been here for a number of years, I understand. And uh, it's like a big family. Uh, as far as making friends, uh, it's difficult because they, they or most of them are from the area and they know people and they sit and talk about people I've never heard of. But that's mm -hmm. that's normal and natural, so I accept that. June? Yes? You've come up with a good idea. It's to put a photograph outside your door of when you were younger so that the staff could recognise what you look like. I'm going to do that. I, I've got a photograph of me 70 years ago mm -hmm. in evening dress, and yeah. I'm going to put it right outside my door. And I, I thank you for that. That's a lovely idea. Yes, I think I think it's a great idea. And when I lived in Moncton briefly, I was volunteering with the Red Cross as a friendly visitor, and I was visiting places like this, and they all had pictures outside their doors of when they were younger. And I think it helps the staff, too, to know that these, especially the ones on the other floor who may have uh, Alzheimer's or something, you know, that once they were young and, yes, definitely. Uh, you know, had ambitions and happiness in their lives. So it's, it's a nice idea. However, I don't know if it would be well received here or not. It depends. I've dug my photograph out already. Oh. And I've ordered a photo frame from my daughter and it'll be up this week. Oh. I think it's a great idea. I really do. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I think it's wonderful if, if, uh, if you persuade people to uh, do that. Can I just put my hand up here and say that I'm deeply, deeply hurt, Doug, that you are not going to put up the caricature of you and me on the bench? <laughs> I mean, I, it, it, or is that a poster in your bedroom? <laughs> it, Aaron. <laughs> yes. The, there's one right over above the dining room menu so that <laughs> <laughs> and that doesn't put people off of their pie well that's good <laughs> they they gotta look at the menu they gotta look at you and me oh and then, my goodness uh, and then and then i have one hanging up beside my uh maple leaf jersey ah. frame in my room okay <laughs> <laughs> No, but you know, it really is so important to remind people that we're the same spirits, we're the same soul, we are the same people. It's just that our suits have gotten a little bit wrinkled over the years, if you know what I yeah, mean. That's right, yes. You know, mm -hmm. it, it's so important, June, and I think that's a wonderful idea that you're suggesting for your residents. Well, maybe they'll do that someday. Well, I hope so. And of course, Doug is leading the way and doing it where he is, which is a wonderful idea. June. You were paid the greatest compliment <laughs> when you offered the use of your bathroom to two workmen yes. as you were heading out to lunch. This was this happened about a year before I left uh, my place in uh, Ottawa. They were replacing the carpets in the halls. So I opened the door to go out for lunch one day and the t these two men were kneeling outside my door or attacking the carpet or the hardwood, I'm not sure. So as I looked at the men and said, hello, how are you, sort of thing, and and I said, look, if you need to use the facilities, I'm going to be gone for at least an hour. The door's always open, so make yourself at home. So one looked at the other one and said, why, nobody's ever offered that. So I said, no, go ahead. And I walked off, and I could hear the other one say, you shouldn't be surprised. Look at the plaque on our door. She's from Newfoundland. <laughs> oh. Amen. Oh, they were talking to each other. They weren't talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, isn't that great? Well, you know what? A recent opinion piece in Reader's Digest Canada did say that Newfoundland is the kindest province, and uh, uh, I've no doubt of that. Yeah, I was just going to say how true that is. Yeah, I think after 9-11, the whole world <laughs> realized, yeah. you know, I'm sure most places would have done just as well, but they did it, and therefore it's chronicled in history. 
I don't know that everybody would have stepped up the way that they did. And we've watched documentaries on it as well, June. And it just, it makes your heart explode with pride. I can't imagine what it's like to actually be from there. But as Canadians, we're kind of riding your coattails in terms of that wonderful kindness. I remember Rob and I, when we were, my husband and I, when we were traveling to Newfoundland, we we were stopped in a town. We'd parked the car or parked the car. And we were looking in a store window, and this gentleman pulled up in his car, rolled down the opposite window, leaned out and said, are you lost? Can I help you? And we were like, what? It was just, it was, it, it's almost stereotypical. And it happened to us right there. And we were invited to kitchen parties, and we went up to a cow's head, and we had a, we had just the most marvelous time, and truly if there could be a little more Newfoundland in the world, the world would be a better place. Oh, how true that what is! What a lovely thing to say. Mm. Oh, it is so true, and I and I could just hear little tiny bits of Newfoundland in your voice too. Just once in a while, it slips out, and it's a beautiful lilting sound that I'm sure brings joy to the people around you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Did you ever have cod's tongue? Uh, I don't think so. Just the sound would put me off. Well, you're right. <laughs> we well, tried it, and it was dreadful. <laughs> I did. They, they also had Cod's Cheeks. Oh, you know what? That's it, Cod's Cheeks. You're right. Yeah. Yes. Oh. Did you ever have those? Nope. Nope. Okay. Well, again, <laughs> pass. Hard pass. But you can't beat a nice cod steak. Uh, well, yes, I've, I've had that growing up because we had no choice. That was it. Yeah, no kidding. It makes good fish and chips, uh, June. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Now, there's a guy who knows, June. We're going to take his word for that. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, let me ask you, as a world, tr well, many parts of the world, British Isles, all over Europe, uh, Russia, Scandinavia, definitely not Australia, if you could go somewhere tomorrow, if somebody said, come on, June, we've got a ticket all paid for you, you're up and at them, you're feeling great, you're ready to go, where would you go? To the UK. Thank you, June. <laughs> I love Britain. My first trip overseas before I even came to Canada was over there. I love Wales. I love Scotland. And, of course, who doesn't love London? That's right. June? Yes? Did you get to go to the Tower of London and see the Crown Jewels? Did I go to the Tower of London? Yes, I most certainly did. And you see the Crown Jewels? Yes, I did. That's quite the experience too, isn't it? Quite something. Oh, my. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, 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 definitely is. And, I, of course, the skyline of London has changed oh, so dramatically yeah. in the last 20 years. Oh, gosh, yes. Yeah. They got that dill pickle. And I've, I've been up in the um, the round thing. In the eye? It's called. In the eye? The eye. I've been up there. You, yeah. Oh, wow. You, can see from, you wouldn't get me on that. You can see for miles. <laughs> the first time I went over was Easter, and I wanted to go to Easter services at Westminster Abbey. Mm. And I did. You did? That was lovely. Oh, how oh. beautiful. What a wonderful experience you've had, June. Yes, for, for a little girl from a small, obscure place in Newfoundland, I've uh, Certainly. <laughs> been a few places. Yeah. <laughs> Do tell us the name of the town in Newfoundland you came from. Oh, I was born in St. John's, the capital. Oh, well then. And then when war broke out, I went to Botwood, which was an air base, airplane base. Uh -huh. And Winston Churchill landed there when he came over for one of his talks, and my father took me to the airport. It was a seaplane base. And I came back and I said, I saw a man who waved at me and he was wearing his long underwear. Oh. He was he was wearing his flying suit. Oh, my and goodness. And I thought it was what we used to call combinations, <laughs> one-piece underwear. <laughs> right. And was that Winston Churchill? Oh, it was, yes. Oh, yeah, he was my there. My goodness. And uh, so I went from there to... Grand Falls, which was the paper mill town. Yeah. And I went to school with Gordon Pinsent. I don't oh know if you know the National Treasure. Marvelous voice. He sat right next to me <laughs> and all he did was draw cartoons and the teacher opined that he would come to no good. <laughs> oh yes. For Little poor did she old know. Gordon Pinsent. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. Now uh, did he get caught talking in class a lot too? I hear that about actors quite frequently. I can't remember if he talked. I think he was too busy drawing cartoons. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Isn't yeah. that a wonderful story? From Gordon uh. Pinsent to Sir Winston Churchill. What a life. <laughs> Before we go, June, do you still read? 
Oh, gosh, yes. Yes, and right now I'm reading an autobiography, Beverly McLaughlin. Can I suggest a book for you to read? Yes, you certainly may. It's called Morning Has Broken by Erin Davis. <laughs> Morning Has Broken by Earl Davis. Aaron okay. Davis, yes. Doug is, um, it's, he's turning into my agent now, but it's a book that I wrote and it was published by HarperCollins in 2019. Uh-huh. And uh, to be immodest, it went to number one on the Globe and Mail bestsellers list. So, oh my goodness. Hopefully you'll find Where? it around there. It's an autobiography and a memoir. And, um, well, it, it would be an honor if you read it because I just feel so honored knowing your story, June. Thank you, Doug. You're welcome. (laughs) Thank you, June. And uh, again, it's been so wonderful to talk to you. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you, June. It was most enjoyable. And thank you to Kadri Phillips for making it all possible on June Campbell's end at Riverside Glen. And to Brendan Cater for being Doug's right hand. Look, we all have a lot to remember these days, so here's a tip. Subscribe for additional episodes and you'll be notified just as soon as they're up. Share your thoughts and opinions on social media using hashtag Elder Wisdom to help others find us on this green bench. We have been thrilled by the level of engagement that these podcast episodes are getting and we would just love you to spread the word with us and for us. Please take a moment to rate and review the Elder Wisdom podcast. And if it's easier, go to www.elderwisdom.ca to find the link. On behalf of Doug Robinson, I'm Erin Davis. We thank you for sharing in these life stories. And we'll talk to you again soon, because your seat on the green bench is ready and waiting. Elder Wisdom. Stories from the Green Bench is brought to you by Schlegel Villages, a complete continuum of care, offering independent living to long-term care, celebrating and honoring the wisdom of the elder. To learn more about us, please go to our website, schlegelvillages.com.